Okay, welcome to the Complete Physio podcast. Uh, I'm Chris Myers, and I'm really excited today that we've got a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Serge Nikolic, uh, who's joined us today uh, to answer some of my questions and some of the questions we have from patients about low back pain and sciatica. So I've known Serge for around 15 years, I think. 16. 16, 16 years. And a half. And a half. And uh, Serge is a good friend of mine. I've got massive professional respect for him. Um, and recently I actually became one of Serge's patients. So this was one of the reasons I wanted to do this podcast is because for 20 years, I've been a physiotherapist seeing people with low back pain, sciatica, disc problems. Um, and then around about a year ago, I started to suffer with leg pain and back pain. Uh, things unfortunately never really got much better. So I sent Serge a WhatsApp. I think it was about eight o'clock. This is true. Eight o'clock on a Thursday morning. I couldn't get off the train. And I was just like, I am fed up with this. I've got to do something about it. So I text WhatsApp Serge. And I think probably two weeks later, I had some spinal injection. So we're going to cover lots of things today. Um, but firstly, Serge, do you want to just introduce yourself? Well, thanks, Chris. And uh, we'll come back to your story it's, uh, and with further details. Uh, so I'm a consultant in spinal pain medicine and neuromodulation. And I have uh, been doing that for, as Chris said, quite a few years. I wouldn't necessarily put a number. I mean, it's as we can all judge, it, we've been around for quite a few years both of us. Uh, we first met on the NHS many years ago when we in the pain clinic in the complex musculoskeletal pain clinic. And this is how I got exposed to, uh, if you like, uh, what, a, what a multidisciplinary approach is like to uh, a spinal pain in particular. And uh, so I do uh, continue to work on the NHS part-time and I work privately and as said, vast majority of my patients are both standard common spinal pain and or limb pain. So to go back to your story, I uh, when I had this text said sort of at a, uh, early, early, early in the morning, I, I first I thought it was a joke. I mean, he was on a night out, and then he just sort of deliberately wanted to wake me up as I had a line, and. Uh, but then I was uh, genuinely, I will say it now and never repeat it again, I was actually flattered that he asked me to uh, look at his back and, uh, and uh, discuss how we're going to go about it as he clearly, as you clearly have been getting fed up with it. Exactly. And so I think something that we want to get across to people that are hopefully watching this or listening to it is because there'll be lots of people out there with back problem sciatica which we'll talk a little bit about my specific problem was that and i had a, a, and you can see here i had a, a disc problem at my l5 which we will go through in more detail that was pushing on the nerve and that's something serge you see as a very common well the uh the, the spinal pain is exceedingly common i mean let's be honest there are many myths about it and hopefully some of them will dispel as the conversation unfolds but the um it is very common. Most of us will get neck pain, lower back pain, leg pain, arm pain at some point in our in our lives. Fortunately, in vast majority of cases, this is entirely benign, self-limiting condition. It tends to settle down. If it doesn't, in majority, 80% of patients, if you like. If it doesn't, then a rehab conservative treatment, if you tends to work, and majority of these patients will improve. Only minority of patients continue to struggle. And these are the patients that I end up seeing, such as was, your, was yourself. Because obviously, we did not have this exchange in the early hours of whatever morning, uh, uh, two days after your problem. Because, yeah, and maybe even longer, I'd just been managing back pain. And then when it, the pain got really bad, when I started to get leg pain. Well, what tends to happen in this case is we all share the same disposition. Where well, something's wrong with your back or leg or, or arm, if, if you like, we tend to ignore it to start with. Then we do what's immediately available and only if it's convenient. If you can reach a paracetamol, then you'll take it. Then we listen to the nearest and dearest. So someone will say, well, go and see this guy, he's a magician, go and see that guy, etc., etc. Only if that, when that does not work would we go and seek further help. And again, we'll touch base actually, when, do, when should one seek help? And when is the back pain not just a back pain, one of those things, if you like, 
when should we kind of intervene? The point I was trying to make uh, is a natural kind of pattern the vast majority of patients will go through. No one comes to see me, no one goes for the injection in the same way you would go to have a massage. Uh, people understandably kind of, they're a bit worried about it, there's all sorts of media coverage about it out there, etc., etc. But they tend to come and seek help when they have actually exhausted all the other stuff and this is ex indeed what happened in your case. So I seem to remember you mentioned back pay some time ago, and I, at that point I said, "Well, how, how are things at the moment? Will you be able? Will you, are you coping? Should we do an injection?" And we sort of decided to treat things expectantly. And this is what tends to happen in majority. As a physio, and obviously I run a physio clinic, a majority of back pain gets better and doesn't see a physio. Then you've got the people that see a physio and get better and then you end up with the people at that point that aren't getting better so the first question is when should you seek help well i it is a little bit of common sense about this all uh do you see and we again we'll discuss a little bit about that what i hear from my patients and i'm sure chris you hear from your patients is can you give me guidelines what i should do or shouldn't do there's sadly there aren't any uh, it is very, it's, ex, it's obviously a benign condition in vast majority of cases, exceedingly, however, complex in terms of what drives what at any point in time. So to go back to your question, if your pain, if you're writhing in agony, that clearly is not a joke. This is not a question of are you a wuss or you test, uh, what, are you a stoic or not? Something's not seriously right. If the back pain is confined to the back pain and it all seizes up, initially, to be honest, people do what the body tells them to do, i.e. get some rest. Get box standard painkillers, as we all do. Get neurofen, paracetamol, take them together after meal, get some rest, see how things are. If that doesn't cut it, and it becomes, particularly if your sleep is interrupted, then... It's not just a kind of a box down a thing. It's not just a little bit of wear and tear. Perhaps you ought to see someone. Perhaps the first port of call I still feel ought to be a musculoskeletal service such as yourself, such as physio, a specialist in that sort of field to assess your function and to do certain tests, just in majority of cases to reassure you, rather than find something that we would worry about. Equally, there are uh, situations where the pain is agonizing, you can't move, you can't, con you, 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 we, you would have to, and in some, in some cases, albeit extremely rare, people do go to any for the right reasons, so we won't discuss the treatment they get in any, but that's appropriate course of action. Sorts of things, and if anybody's watching this, if you just Google red flags low back pain there's these things that we refer to as red flags and those are a very very small percentage of people where they probably need to see somebody uh, either sooner rather than later or in some cases immediately so can you just give us and we're not going to do all of them but give us a few examples of what we well often people hear this term red flags what that means is that it, it essentially it's a cluster of symptoms and signs that war should warn one that this is beyond a little bit of wear and tear. Something more is happening and that there is a potential danger and a potential for long-term issues, if you like, and sequelae. Uh, and the, what we commonly would sort of say, if you have had no issues with your back pain or leg pain in the past, you suddenly develop severe pain, you suddenly develop weakness in your legs, a weakness in your legs is like essentially it's not because you can you because it's not because you can't do zumba no one can do zumba when the back is hurting but it's if genuinely if you want to move your leg and your muscles would not follow you start you start to walk and your leg gives way you have profound pins and needles numbness in the leg that's not just you shake it off and it goes but more importantly if you suddenly get this pins and needles funny sensation numbness in the groin area if you can't control your sphincters, and that implies both incontinence, but also you want to go to pan past the water, but you can't, you have all of these issues, then really that's, that's something more serious kind of happening. 
that's we called called a coin and they said that well that means essentially now that you mention it that means that there is a big event happening at the lumbar spine level usually a big disc that slipped and again we'll show you images of that and that's compressing the nerves but not just the nerves quite a few nerves in the lumbar area in the lower back area and some of them would control your uh, uh, sphincter function some of them will control your uh, motor power etc etc what tends to happen, which is important when it comes to motor power or declining motor power and unable to move, in you, to move your leg or arm, frankly, for that matter, that means that a compression on that nerves is more significant than not. Because the way nerves are arranged, the motor fibers are actually in the middle of that nerve. So the fact that they are effective indicates that the compression is significant. And one would then consider, we need to, are we going to do some minimal invasive interventions, such as injections? Are we, will we have to do something more invasive, such as surgery? But these are exceptions. It's certainly, these are, these are rare, rare, rare events. But what is important is if you do have any change in your bladder or bowel dis dysfunction, really severe pain, and also if you have symptoms on both sides. Sim indeed. But also it applies, the, 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 it's not just a kind of lower back. It's, sometimes it's more worryingly, albeit thankfully very rare when you had significant degenerative changes in the neck. And these degenerative changes in the neck, apart from the usual, Christ, I can't move my neck, it's all in spasm, it's all I can't move, etc. You would have profound changes and, and uh, pain and sensory disturbances, as we call them, pills and needles, numbness in the arms, and unable, uh, you wouldn't be, one wouldn't be able to control the arms properly, the grip strength would be affected. But also, sometimes you get leg symptoms, even though the problem is much higher up in the spine. And, uh, and this then becomes uh, quite an urgent situation because it would, it would indicate that the spinal cord itself is compressed higher up in the neck. And if that is left untreated, potentially can lead to serious problems long term. Again, that is very rare, and that's not what we're going to discuss in much detail uh but i think for 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 layman's and patients listening to this i think even just from what we've talked so far it is complicated there's lots of things that you know whoever's assessing you needs to be aware of and that is why we would recommend that you do see a specialist in these areas i, could, I couldn't because agree you've more. got to get the right information and it's only when you get that correct diagnosis are you going to know exactly what to do and and i think that's the first message isn't it is if you're really struggling what is your diagnosis and that that leads us into the next question really is if somebody has had pain for a significant period of time be it low back or sciatica which is obviously uh, some pain in the leg at what point should they get an MRI scan there's lots of you know well there is a the MRI uh... MRIs are quite accessible. Uh, it all depends, uh, I if you like. There are certain guidelines out there who would advise this. In reality, to be perfectly honest, MRI scan is entirely non-invasive inv investigation. It does not involve any radiation. It doesn't involve anything like that. Um, MRI scan, I personally feel, ought to be offered to people who actually are failing to improve what we've just discussed. So you're, you're, not better, you're not better after your painkiller's bit of rest. You're not better seeing you, Chris, or, or having a bit of rehab. Things actually are deteriorating. You can't actually make progress with, with bog-standard conservative treatment. I personally feel it's entirely appropriate to, to arrange an MRI scan. MRI scan would then show us, is this, what are we talking about? Is this a generalized wear and tear? Is this a disc problem? Is it more a joint problem? Are we looking at something, if, if you like, more dangerous that someone needs to worry about, which is unlikely, and all of that? And more importantly, in majority, if not vast majority of, of, of people out there, it reassures you. I don't know about you, but if I had a pain for a long, long time, I would want to know, regardless of what the guidelines say. Incidentally, what the guidelines do say is offer MRI scan if there is a significant neurological deficit. What that means is that you have a massive leg pain, sciatica. There is a motor power issue, so there is not quite strength in that leg. leg. You have weakness, you're tripping out when you, when you walk, all this profound numbness or any numbness in the groin, etc. Only then would you offer an MRI scan. Um, I 
I'm, I can't say I agree with that. I, I think MRI scans are useful. And the way I see this and the way I can discuss this with my patients, it is essential that they know and see what we are talking about. Because without that full knowledge of what the issue is, I can't support them in their self-management. Spinal pain management is certainly is not about only your intervention or indeed my injection or spinal cord stimulation or surgery. Spinal pain management, particularly chronic spinal pain management, hinges on, on, on a person's involvement and, and uh, long term. And correct team, everything, and I could not emphasize this more, everything these days hinges on this buzzword multidisciplinary approach. Because the, unfortunately, in the majority of cases, again, these are minority of general population, but in majority of these cohort of patients that I see, or you and I, Chris, share, if you like, the only way forward is a joint approach, given the fact that none of us have anything straightforward like uh, the analogy would be dentistry. You've got a toothache. I know what the problem is. I'll take it out. That's the on, all done and dusted and off. But unfortunately, sometimes it is. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it isn't. It does involve one's change in the way they see themselves and the, and the change in their lifestyle, if you like, to incorporate uh, 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 optimization of their overall spinal dynamics. So we can conclude that MRIs are very useful and at some point it would be natural to do an MRI to get more information, to find out exactly what's going on and get a diagnosis. The issue with MRIs, as we know, is that it doesn't always give the patient the answer that they need and what I mean by that is quite often you can have very severe pain but actually the consultant or the person that's reading the MRI or the physio has said well you've got some you know terms like degenerative changes you've got some wear and tear in your back but they don't feel like that's giving them any more well, for, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, as, as I, again, often tell my patients, oh, well, indeed, I show them the uh, presentation, PowerPoint presentation. There have been studies out there that have studied normal people. People, no symptoms, no symptoms whatsoever, no pain, no issues whatsoever. And they, they, they've done this across the many kind of range, um, age groups, if, if you like. And you look at the MRI scan findings, significant proportion of these people who have no symptoms whatsoever have wear and tear changes in the MRI. And they can have a disc prolapse. They can have all sorts of things that we see commonly. So what I say is like when a patient comes in to see me and I look at the MRI, in certain cases, I, and if I don't know anything about the patient in advance, in certain cases, that particular patient can tell me any story. So that's why the MRI scan findings per se uh, are important, but equally we need to marry this, we need to tally this with individual symptoms, and only then would we be able to sort of come up and formulate some management plan that will lead uh, hopefully into, into, into recovery and facilitate rehabilitation and improve the self-management. Uh, the other thing about the MRIs is that uh, what needs to one needs to understand they don't tell us where the pain is we 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 uh, this is the problem and this is exceedingly difficult for patients to actually understand this and accept this that's i mean they rationalize it because obviously we speak roughly the same language but but it's but it's very difficult to accept uh and there is no investigation on this planet that will actually tell you well this is your predominant pain generator this is the secondary so on and so forth so we extrapolate from the static image, images into reality, if you like. And admittedly, in the vast majority of cases, they tally. But one needs to bear in mind, at the end of the day, you treat the patient or the scan, and obviously there are exceptions to that, but let's not kind of digress. So we do it's have... Quite a, a, it's, yeah, so it's quite a hard concept for sometimes for a patient to understand that you've got an MRI scan, there's lots of things on that MRI scan that are actually in theory abnormal but could be age-related change and then say for example you find a disc problem or a facet problem but it's very hard sometimes it's obvious but a lot of the time because there's a few things going on it's hard to know what the pain generator is it is as i've said uh, 
Admittedly, that's not that common, but it's certainly not uncommon, uncommon. In majority of cases, they do tally. That's why we're actually ordering MRI scans, because they do. But when you talk about those specific degenerative changes, we all have them. I mean, the clock is ticking clockwise, even for you, Chris, although you're desperately trying to avoid it. Uh, uh, they, we all have these wear and tear changes. So why should one person get it and not the other? Who would tell? Who so would that's know? my next question, sir. So from your vast experience, you could look at five MRI scans and you wouldn't be able to predict who's got the worst pain, where the pain is. or It would be on the balance of probabilities. It would be on the balance of probabilities. So on the balance of probabilities, this patient is coming in five minutes and I'm looking at the scan is likely to have left-sided sciatica. Or this, the other patient, is likely to have right-sided arm pain. But the problem is, when that person becomes pain-free, this, and this is another interesting thing to get your head around, is, and it's hard for patients, is you could re-MRI them. So if you re... Okay, here's a good one. My MRI showed I had a disc problem at L5, and we're going to show the guys either on this podcast or the next one where my problem was. If you MRI'd me today... We know, both know my MRI would look, look exactly the same, yet I have no pain. Okay, that is one possibility. Equally, it can look a bit better. Uh, well, I mean, in your case, in, in your case, it's related it can, to age. But but it, but... <laughs> it can, but it doesn't have that nice... You know, pe- patients always go, well, let's look at it again. Let's do another scan and see no, if no, it's but better. This is, this it's is not going to be... This is, this is where it comes to. We need to, patients need to understand. It, it's always, once you do the first scan, and particularly if, the, if there is a very little progress made in overall improvement, people kind of feel, well, let's look at it again. Let's, it doesn't quite work like that, nor does it actually achieve much. But to go back to your stuff, in some cases, and this it's perhaps more relevant to acute situation rather than yours, so I take your point entirely. But in some cases, sciatic is common. So why do certain people, kind of without your involvement or my involvement, suddenly get better? They do get better because the body has the inherent ability to contain the issue and deal with it. So in majority of these cases, they, before they come to see us, that slip disc, the body absorbs it a bit. Now, admittedly, from a worn disc, that disc never springs back into a plump little kind of perfect shape. But that doesn't matter because in, in most of us, the discs are worn. So who would get it then? Yes, yeah, so who... What are the predictors of the back predictors, pain? And... The predictors, there's a difference between the predictors and, and what we feel is kind of a prevalence, if you like. We don't quite know what, what we do know. It tends to be ever so slightly more common in men. It tends to be ever so slightly more common in tall because the spine evolutionary, if, if you like, is not quite designed to carry the load and forces imposed on it in an upright position when the gravity kicks in. And not just that, ergonomically, the pub chair isn't fitted to a six foot five. I wouldn't know about the pub, I don't (laughs) drink it. And then it's ever so slightly more common in obese. Again, for the same reasons, the spine is struggling. Robust as it is, it's actually struggling to deal with forces. It's ever so slightly more common in manual laborers and sportsmen, which is quite important to understand. There is no treatment on this planet that's specifically designed to facilitate one's sporting aspirations. Although we can discuss it, we will discuss this at a later at a later point. And it's ever so slightly more common in smokers. There is some uh, indication about the genetics involvement, and I hear this quite often with patients. Understandably, they we all expose these data to media, etc. Um, we don't quite know what the genetic burden is. We don't quite know the, pre- the predominance of specific genes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it does seem to cluster in the families. So it's not just in one's head, yeah. if you like. Yeah. There, it's more common, particularly in twins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is some genetic predisposition. Perf. But will that predisposition result in debilitating disability in later life? That's unlikely. No. And there are other factors, aren't there? Like the psychosocial side of it. We know that if you have depression, there is a link between that and low back pain. They, there's a bit of that on that subject, and I hear this again, particularly in prolonged pain states. It's a, it's a difficult kind of question. It's a bit of a chicken and egg. If you can imagine, none of us actually, we can talk about it from the comfort of this chair, particularly you now that you're better after the injection. But, uh, uh, but people who struggle for a prolonged period of time with pain, 
It's enormous psychological overlay. It's enormous psychological burden. I mean, particularly if you do, the, one of the worst problems is the, our inability to label people. So what I mean As by that, to, uh, yeah. yes, to, um, what I mean by that, they've got wear and tear, but we are not giving them diagnosis. And without giving you diagnosis, we are not validating you. And if we are not validating you, as time passes, you start to question yourself. So when you go out with your mates for a pint, they say, well, how bad is your back? It's really bad today. What is it again? I say, well, I don't know, wear and tear. And I was like, well, what do you mean? I was like, you've seen 10 people, don't they know? Well, wear and tear. We are not able to label you in the same way you've got diabetes. You've got blood pressure. It has and a huge impact on patients. An enormous that. impact. And, and they grind, can't, you can't and see anything. One down. If you've got, uh, a, I don't know, if you've broken your finger and they go, did your finger hurt? You go, yeah, look at that. And it's completely mangled. Yeah, but this is the Whereas problem. Whereas with the back, it's everything. This is what look, I often say, any particularly young, in young men. Because young men generally uh, feel that they ought to be, they're, they're destined to be stoics. I can relate. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you can. Uh, destined to be stoics, brave, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, providers and all part of their the identity. Joker. Yes, part of all of that. Yet they, uh, yet they suffer. So when I see to be, uh, speak to patients, as you rightly say, it's, you don't see it. It's like they look normal from this distance. People who look normal are expected to be normal. Yet today may be yet another difficult day. They struggle. So as time passes, they're fed up thinking about it, let alone voicing it. Yet we all need a hug. It's exceedingly complex, complex, complex situation. It does, and so in it, in fact, very rare that you would sort of say, "Christ, it's all in your head." Yeah. It's, yeah of yeah, course, yeah. it's in your head. This is where we feel pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it's exceedingly rare that that they're, they're, they're making it up. Yeah, and it's normally a combination between a structural, physical Indeed. manifestation, and yes, those other things. Um, yeah, but that doesn't 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 label it. one a wuss. No, not at all. Well, going back to your point, Serge, I, you know, I responded very well to your injections, but the month before that, if that had been another, you know, look, unfortunately, if if I was waiting eighteen months for it on the NHS, I did go private because I was basically getting fed up. If I wasn't going to get better through the injections, or if I wasn't going to be able to get an appointment, I can see myself. I could see how I could get depressed. Well, it's, 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 it's indeed it's, it's, it's a kind of, thing. and it results in fear avoidance behavior. Is we all have it, sort of once bitten, twice shy. With even without your kind of will coming into it, the body, the spine readjusts itself and tries desperately to compensate. So your other bits and pieces that are were not particularly affected suddenly try to take over, and then you overload that, so it becomes a mess, even more so. So all I'm, uh, I think, I think usually. Patients know when they reach a critical point. My personal advice would be to all of these uh, uh, patients who have ongoing back, back, leg pain, neck, arm pain. If you feel you have finished with your, you give it, a, you give it a decent shot. We're excluding the red flags. Decent shot with your rehabilitation, conservative treatment, etc., etc., etc. The symptoms persist. You feel you are grinding you down. More importantly, the time is passing. We are not talking three days. We are talking a few months, usually three days. We all cope with things. And then it's really, really appropriate to find something to uh, uh, to seek proper uh, uh, to, uh, attempt to reach a diagnosis and, and and potential and potential treatment because one needs to be at that point proactive, yeah, rather than going to full chronicity. Yeah, and there is that risk. And isn't there, there is that risk. Chronicity, yeah. then disability, then. Uh, uh, affects one's work, loss of job for medical reasons, etc. It doesn't bear thinking. And at some point, you're trying to break that cycle, Indeed. aren't you? Indeed. It's all about the breaking the pain cycle. The injections that I offer, they're not magic by any means, not do I ever tell to patients that they are. It felt like magic. Well, I know, I mean, I know. But, said you, uh, but the, the, uh, what the aim of the injection, and again, we will discuss this in the, in the next podcast, the aim of the injection is actually indeed that, to break the pain cycle. How? By introducing a very small amount of steroid locally around this acute disc, around the upset nerve, if you like, be it in the lumbar lower back area or the neck area. And it's actually the steroid that is the one that reduces this acute inflammation, swelling, irritation both in the discs and to an extent in the nerves, and in doing so breaks the pain cycle. But the ultimate purpose of that is, is to facilitate your good work with them and their self-management. 
and then optimize whatever can be optimized in terms of back muscles, core muscles, all the usual stuff we do. Exactly. So my situation is that I felt immediate pain relief or a couple of days later, I was pretty much pain free. Like I still am three months down the line. But as a physio, I knew that just all that was doing was giving me a window of opportunity. Now, if I didn't do physio after it, I think, and from experience, in three to four months or even six months or a year, I'm adamant, I'm sure it will come back. So if I can then strengthen my muscles, get more mobile, generally get fitter, I'm hoping that it doesn't just wear off. And I no, think well, that's where physio it, comes well, in. Well, in majority of cases, in majority of cases, what tends to happen, no injection whatsoever, or surgery, frankly, for that matter, or my spinal cord stimulation, for that matter, does not turn the clock back. No, no. So what it aims to achieve is push the situation into more steady state, push that particular person who is struggling to the person who is not struggling yet, they have similar MRI scan findings, if, if that makes sense. So... Uh, uh, the as you rightly say, is the object is to improve self management, and and to be honest, I mean yes, complete your rehabilitation. We aim to educate these people so they we wean them off of us, yeah. and they continue with their self management, embrace principles of all this rubbish that we hear these days, various other uh, 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 exercise based strategies, uh, which should be part of their life. Yeah, absolutely. And I was just going to say the other thing is talking about how these things affect you psychologically and the impact and how things become chronic if your injection and i was scared if the injection didn't work what's next because the injection not only helps therapeutically we'll come on to this in a minute but diagnostically it also helps because you've clearly hit the bit that's hurting so we were talking earlier that the mri scan it gives you an idea of where the pain's coming from, but if you can then do a targeted intervention, then we can pretty much conclude that the injection that you did was put in the area where my pain was coming from. But what I was going to say, Serge, is if you hadn't helped, and this comes into a lot, a lot of people will be thinking if they're at home, well, I've, I've tried this, I've tried that. The more interventions that don't that are ineffective... I can see how you can become very, you can get into a cycle where you do get depressed and where you literally feel like nobody well, can help the, what, you. What I tell to my patients in a similar situation, okay, uh, the, 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 we need to adopt a pragmatic approach. And that means we need to make sure and do everything as much as we can at this present moment in time to establish what the pathology is, what the pain generators are. Once we, once we have done that, depending on the findings, if you like, we then, and we are talking patients again, uh, no patients who have had it for three days who haven't seen you or haven't had paracetamol. We have patients that have continued to struggle. Then we need to discuss the role of injections and the targeted injections. And the reason I say targeted injections is all of these injections, as you right, rightly say, I label or we label diagnostic slash therapeutic. Because the MRI scan findings, as I've said earlier, they don't show you exactly where the pain generator is. But through the needle for these injections, I don't give anyone a painkiller. So a local anesthetic that I give you is not a painkiller. Steroid is not a painkiller. Both local anesthetic and steroid, in some cases, help with pain through uh, uh, reducing inflammation in the area that is pain generator. Therefore, diagnostically, we prove that this is the case. If that fails to improve the situation, we sometimes can consider it again if it's reasonable. We feel sometimes we consider something that we call radio frequency or pulse radio frequency. If that doesn't help, then it should not be one man's decision as to what we do next. In these cases, I would then take the case and present it at a spinal multidisciplinary meeting. So you've got a spinal surgeon, you've got yourself. Neurosurgeons, the neuroradiologists, and sort of once a week, week in the evening, we just endlessly discuss cases that are either complex to start with or cases that are failing to improve with what we feel is a conventional approach. And then we have a consensus view and sort of say, well, this is a, this is a consensus view from us as a group, what we, we feel ought to be done next. And that ranges from nothing, get on with it, which is less likely, to all sorts of bizarre things and anything in between. But this is the natural sequence of events. The role of surgery these days could compare to the olden days 
or rather the indications of surgery, if you like, have shrunk massively for the right, very specific for the, for the, for the right reasons. So just going on from that, Serge, so uh, what, and slightly more, you know, for people watching, when should somebody consider a spinal injection? Is it if they have, and just go on to whether it's the back pain or the leg pain and how that works. Uh, you certainly would not consider spinal injection five days into it. No one would. No one, no one, no one, and no one, I, no one I offer it. It varies. I mean, if you look in the, the definition, it's you like the, the chronic pain is defined as pain felt longer than three months. But equally, I'm not suggesting in a three months period, perhaps it's not time to do that, if you like. It, 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 it's essentially very, very, very individual. And as you say, pain levels, etc. Is it back pain? Is it leg pain? How affected are you? What, what sort of what limitations does one have? Does it affect your work, the sleep pattern, etc., etc.? Um, once that time is passed from self from self management, painkillers, rest, what have you, I feel in majority of cases they ought to have a bit of rehab. Now, provided they can comply. And Some, provided they see somebody that has a lot of experience yeah, I couldn't, of that I, I specific could area. Not, I could not emphasize. Yeah. That's why we continue to socialize, shall we say, because we, we worked together for a long time with a whole group of your good physiotherapists, et cetera, et cetera. So I feel confident, you know, when I say patients, this is not just I know what you can do. And I know not because just we had a pine the other night. I just know because we work together. We run the clinics together and, and, and all, all of that. So, but if a patient f is consistently failing to improve with your treatment, if a patient can't comply with your treatment, what that means is that you, because, because you simply can't do, Chris, whatever you ask me to do, if there are new symptoms that are in developments, then I feel that the rehab ought to stop at this juncture. Uh, because of worsening, or it's a lack of progress. Equally, I see patients, you know, who have had years of physiotherapy day in and day out. Minimal progress, if you like. So we all need to know, kind of, if you like, our limitations. And this is where, again, emphasis is on us working together rather than me taking your tooth out or you kind of do whatever. Um, and only, only that way uh, are we likely to make any significant impact, uh, if you like, long term. So the message is you're not ever going to rush to a spinal injection, as you're saying. It's going to be individual to the person. Levels of pain will always come into it. Some people can tolerate pain better than others. So pain tolerance, you know, is different between different individuals. And also, if you're the sort of person, I saw a guy this morning who's a rock climber. His whole life and livelihood and what he enjoys doing is rock climbing. And he's, he's had pain for two weeks. And his first thing he came in and said was, I think I need a spinal injection. Whereas the next person will wait two years well, to get I mean, it done. Well, I mean, this is this very individual. We yeah. all have the same disposition. I mean, it, it, similar disposition in that sense. But then we differ enormously, if you like. When something's wrong with you, you want to know why. And then you want to fix it. That's natural, you see. And, but we all develop different mechanisms to deal with the, the, with the situation whereby, well, actually, we don't have the exact diagnosis. We, we can't quite fix it. But the, so we established, I couldn't agree more, injections are not far from panacea. But they're on the individual basis, they have certainly their purpose. And more importantly, in majority of cases, no one's going to offer you anything more invasive without trying something as safe as the injections. Which brings me to the next thing. Some people postpone and procrastinate and procrastinate and procrastinate. Um, I'm not implying they're wussies particularly, but they're worried. And they're worried there's lots of negative media coverage about these injections. And, uh, and this is through sheer lack of knowledge, if you like. But also some people are worried about steroids. And uh, you, I reassured each and all of them. Uh, there is the, 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 allow, the, the reasons we allow to do these injections. We do them in selected patients. So it's medically logical to offer targeted anti-inflammatory medications to the upset area. Number two is it does stand the chance and majority of patients, the cycle would be broken. For how long? We can discuss that later. Number three, generally, they're really safe. And number four, equally important as the other three. There isn't anything better at that stage. They have already tried something that's conservative. There isn't anything, spe I'm talking about majority, there isn't anything specifically invasive surgery 
or advanced treatments than one would consider. So it's appropriate. Steroids, let me tell you now, and we'll just won't discuss steroids. Steroids in these doses in vast majority of patients are absolutely safe to consider. People who have asthma take steroids every single day of their lives, yet they live. But often I hear patients who will say, well, what about the steroids? That, that myth, about, myth about steroids comes from the olden days when they were given by anyone to anything. Particularly, particularly, yes. Yes, but also they used to be given, as I'm sure, because you do this injection and stuff, but they were done in the olden days ridiculously often by various people, particularly around large tendons. And if they're given day in and day out around there, they can cause weakening, they can snap and whatever. And this is how the negativity uh, 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 started around it. But to reassure all listeners, they're absolutely safe in this circumstance. Yeah, absolutely. And so in my case, so I had the steroid injections um, and they they helped. Do you want to just talk? It was a struggle doing the injections. You really were, you know. Very wiggly. Very wiggly and very I just wussy, get, wussy. I do want to get wussy. this specific comment on camera. You did ask me, do I want sedation? Yes, you? you did, yes. You said only a few people have ever coped without sedation. I'm not sure you actually said that. Anyway, I went without sedation. I was very brave, wasn't I? You, you, you were so brave. And I think, actually, I'm so pleased I didn't have the sedation because, and I'm not just saying that because we're friends, Serge. I, I've had shoulder injections. I hardly felt it. And I did see the size of the needle and it's I, not that, small. That's just me. That's just unique to me. Well, yeah. it was yeah, very yeah. impressive, I must say. And... Do you want to just talk a little bit more? Uh, and the, I really want the the I really want to get this across. There is a difference. So you can have back pain, you can have back and leg pain, which we would call sciatica, in this case, which is a layman's terms for an umbrella of problems. But let's say it's leg pain going down the whole leg, or you can just have sciatica where you have no low back pain. Can you talk? Just bearing in mind, speaking to the layman what your thought process is around that and how it might change what you do. Well, you, when you have a mixture, sort of back and leg, it's very difficult, if you like, to pinpoint the primary pathology. Still, if the pain is felt in the leg, uh, and we label it sciatica, and particularly if it goes below the knee, then it is likely to be sciatica. And sciatica, the commonest cause of, uh, for sciatica by far is a slip disc. So the disc is slipped, and I'll show you an image in a second. The disc is, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. It's not accurate in the slightest. It's not accurate in the slightest. I mean, slip disc, in, who knows what it means. There are different grades of disc uh, bulges, if you like. They range from protrusion, extrusion, sequestration, they're all of that. But in a late term term, slip disc is a slip disc. Now, a slip disc is uh, uh, more likely than not to cause predominant leg pain, but often would cause back pain as well. Because they push you on the nerve, but then everything is irritated at a spinal level. The nerves pick up that, that information gets into the spine. The spine tells the brain something is not right. But what the spine also does, bypassing the brain, it sends information back to the lower back to seize all the muscles up. Because the spine is desperately trying to stop you from moving and prevent, to protect you and prevent further damage. Uh, so it becomes really a little bit more complex. Historically, one would sort of argue if your back pain increases when you, bend, uh, when you bend backwards, that's more likely to be the joints. If it increases when you bend forwards, it's more likely to be the disc. These are very crude ways of assessing the situation. Um, it is not uncommon, as I've said, to see pure leg pain. People can't understand that concept, that the whole problem can... Yes, but this is, this, is, well, this is why it's really important to get another message across. In, in our world, we label things when it comes to how do we label pain. We label it as mechanical nociceptive pain or nerve or neuropathic type pain. And there is also something that we call nociplastic pain, but let's not confuse the issues. Mechanical, if you like, or nociceptive pain is your joint pain in your back. You've got a back pain, you have minimal leg pain, you can have a bit of leg pain as a referred pain, but the main issue is the back pain. Joint, the joint's upset, the, the nerves around there that inform the spine and the brain are functioning fine, and the body's trying to do what it's meant to do. Or equally, when one breaks your leg, it hurts like hell, and, but this is normal. It's meant to happen. With a neuropathic pain, things are different. So sciatica is actually a neuropathic pain. 
because there's, as you rightly say, there's nothing wrong with your leg. Never was. It, it never was. The reason it felt in the leg is because the disc is squashing the nerve higher up in the lumbar spine, if you, if you like. And because the way the, uh, the nervous system is arranged, particularly in your brain, uh, the, the information that sciatic nerve picks up is from the leg. Therefore, the brain will assume that it's the leg. But it's an exceedingly difficult concept to grasp. So, a bit like when I had my injections, what sort of information do you give patients and like what to do after their injections? Well, the commonest thing I hear that from them is actually what, what, what advice I need to follow afterwards. And unfortunately, there isn't any apart from common sense. So what I do tell them... Some people don't have common yeah, sense. Yeah, so true. <laughs> what I do tell them is that, uh, that uh, it may take a couple of weeks before anything happens. So, so let's, let's, let's say, go on to that a bit more, Serge, because I know I was sitting there day two going, I'm not sure this has worked. Or no, it had worked, but... When would you expect that improvement and how long would it continue but this on is, for? This is, yeah, yeah. It varies enormously. It, it, some people feel great on day one. Some people it takes a couple of weeks, sometimes longer before anything happens. And the reason for that is because the beneficial effect of the injection hinges on the certain uh, physiological changes, if you like, that the steroid uh, itself produces. And that takes very variable period of time to complete. Uh, therefore, if I see a patient after the injection, 10 days after the injection, and a patient tells me, well, I'm none the wiser, no better, I can't label that patient as a non-responder because it may yet happen. So normally I would tell them when I consent them and when I discuss the injections with them, I, I, I would basically say that it can take anything up to two to three weeks to work. Then ne their next question, rightly so, would be, would be, well, what should I do during that time? And it really is common sense. Personally, I would advise just take it easy for a couple of days, few days. Then you can start a gentle exercise. Depending on the relationship you have with your physiotherapist or whoever, you can start gentle loading, provided that one feels that gentle loading is not making it worse. As long as one has a low threshold for resting, if you feel like resting, really, most things should be fine. Uh, but it, I keep stressing this because you'd be surprised that patients out there, particularly sportsmen who come for this, they give them a bit of warmth and etc. On day three, they go wild, go back to cage fighting. That's not really how I want it to happen. Apart from that, uh, there is very little advice one should give them. I, did tell, I do tell them that the pain can, in some cases, does get a little bit worse after the procedure. That's, that's, not, that's not uncommon, means nothing. It will pass. Why do you get it, not someone else? Again, we have no idea. Is, this, is that something that some people call steroid flare or not? Difficult to say. In spine, that's less common compared to the joint injections through sheer confined space. But even so, it's important that they know they don't panic, if you like. And, uh, and certainly, they should take any medications they want to take, if you like, in terms of, of painkillers until we review the situation yeah. later on. Yeah, so and and obviously we see I as a physio we generally see people sort of day ten, day fourteen, where hopefully because a majority do have pain relief by then, but obviously you could still get more pain relief after that. And certainly for my own personal thing is I obviously increased my walking, I kept an eye on my step count, I got onto a bike which I'm still doing, so went to spin classes after about three weeks. Um, and then I've started some Pilates exercises and, and going back to the gym. But there is no doubt, we're trying to get back to the gym, so, uh, but there's no doubt that it needs to be very gradual. Now, I'm a physio, so I've got a general idea of that, but certainly there'll be, it's very important, I think, to be guided by somebody I, I, this is what this that is. sees lots of these. Again, again. Well, regardless of how we approach this subject, we come back to the same thing. And that's the conclusion that if we're going to make any difference to these endless people who experience this problem, we need to do it together. Because uh, uh, that hinges on good communication, hinges on loop being closed. So you know what, what, the, what the stage of play is, what, I, what I've done. You know when to intervene, if you like. Equally, I know when you get stuck with someone and when I intervene. And only in that way, are we going to make a difference rather than you do your own stuff, I do my own stuff? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Okay, I think that brings us to an end, Serge. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks Solid again for um, helping my pain. Long may it continue. Indeed, yeah. indeed. 
Um, and I know we're going to go on and do some other podcasts now, and we're going to talk a little bit more around MRI scans, a little bit more specific about what type of injections uh, you can do. And I think you are going to show my MRI scan and show a normal scan. So I think that would be really useful. Um, so yeah, hopefully people will go on to that. We can't cover everything, obviously, in in one session. There's a lot, isn't there, around It is certainly pain. a lot. We haven't even started the neck. And no, then no. And we, will, we will come back to that as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Serge. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.